There's someone in my head, but it's not me. I'm certain that you have heard of someone acting out of character. A plea often put forward by the defence in a criminal case is that the defendant was acting out of character, that he or she has an unblemished record. Character witnesses will be presented to show what an upstanding citizen is standing up before the jury, and the judge in passing sentence may well take the defendant's previous good character into account as a mitigating factor. This is all presented as if the defendant somehow was not in charge of their own mind when they carried out whatever heinous crime is under consideration. And of course they weren't. I am increasingly coming to the opinion that none of us are in control of our minds. We are but passengers in our own brains. What we call our consciousness is nothing more than an emergent state of awareness, an artifact that is the result of the processing which takes place within our brains. I showed in a previous video how our brains perform rationalization after the fact, and I think that is probably the extent of who we are. It does not seem that way. It is almost offensive to be told that we are mere passengers in a biochemical machine. We feel affronted by the idea. Or do we? Where do those feelings of offence and affront originate? Did you consider them, or did they simply arise as emotions which you then reacted to? Our brains react to stimuli continuously, both external and internal, and our emergent awareness then tries to make sense of those reactions, but always after the event. We know that we do not store a complete narrative in memory for each event in our life, and we know that different aspects of our memories are stored in different areas of our brain. Memories are reconstructed upon retrieval and, again as I showed in a previous video, they are not always constructed accurately in the first place and can be further corrupted during reconstruction. Our brain fills in gaps and tidies up the narrative. This is why eyewitness evidence is not compelling. You may witness something and store the details in memory more or less accurately, often less, but later you might discuss the event with others, read about it or watch news reports. Every time you do that, you retrieve your own memories and manipulate them. You cannot prevent details from other sources being stored back as your own memories. Updating memories is an important survival trait. If you are dumped on the savannah and come across a cute little creature that wants its tummy tickled, you will store pleasant memories of that event. If the next time you meet the little ball of fluff it is in the company of its very unlittle parents, who are all teeth and claws, and you are fortunate enough to have survived that meeting, then on subsequent encounters, when Fluffy alone appears, you will want the warning bells to be ringing loud and clear, telling you that the teeth and claws are never far away. When you consider that every stimulus that enters your brain has to be tested against your memories before it can be processed, then you will understand that your experience of that stimulus is a construction manufactured in your brain's retrieval systems. Your responses also have to be stored by first categorizing them against your memories with the same fallible processes involved. In short, you react and then you think about why you reacted. Of course our brains are continually learning as we live and we therefore have the sense that we are making decisions based on past experiences, that we have willpower and choose our direction. But to misquote Wittgenstein, how would our lives look if our brains operated exactly as I say? Can you show me a way in which things would be different? Think about your five senses for a moment. Any of these are able to trigger a strong emotion in your brain. I'm not going to go into a detailed discussion on the topic of emotions, but I will say that I think that under examination there are two root emotions, get closer and get away. Things that make us feel good, we want to get closer to. Things that make us feel bad we want to get away from, or want them to go away. And from an evolutionary point of view this makes complete sense. Avoid that which can do you harm, and pursue that which can do you good. Of course our brains evolved in a world where much of what was good for us was also hard to come by, and much of what was bad for us was all around. Civilization has to an extent turned that on its head. Refined sugar, carbohydrates and fat are not a struggle to obtain for most of us, and teeth, claws, famine and drought are not an ever-present danger. 
Add to these gambling, alcohol, nicotine and other drugs, which exploit areas of our brain not evolved to deal with them, and pornography, which does the same, and we are living in a world we are not easily able to cope with. Meanwhile, the news media and politicians try to convince us that we continue to live in a world full of teeth and claws, in order to manipulate us for their own ends, but that's perhaps for another day. Why do all of these things cause us problems? Why are we not able to elevate ourselves above these animal desires? Why do even those who profess to live lives beyond the grasp of base desires so often fall from the pedestals they have erected for themselves? Why do good people do bad things? That's simple. There are no good people. There are only people. And people do things. If I return to my two base emotions, they evolved to allow us to survive. In fact, without them, we would not have survived. Long before we evolved the cogitating abilities which came with our neocortex, we had to react to survive. Had our brains been designed to exist in a world full of milk and honey, with a petting zoo stuffed with T-Rexes, lions and crocodiles, then an inbuilt ability to react faster than we can think would not be necessary, because we would never be under an imminent threat. Of course, if our designer already knew that all his plans were going to turn to rat shit, then he might have future-proofed us with defensive measures, but that would kind of defeat the point, don't you think? Back in the real world, and for our not-so-distant predecessors, or wandering lunch, as they were known to many of the creatures with which they shared the planet, speed was everything. Those who were too slow to react didn't get to pass on their genes. We are the result of many thousands of ancestors who reacted quickly enough. Let's visit the savannah again. You and Tharg are strolling along when a big cat drops out of a tree in front of you. The moment you pause to think about what to do is the moment that you become lunch. You have three choices. Flight, fight or freeze. Well, possibly a fourth, but only if the cat is very obliging. Hopefully you are wired for the correct response in that given situation, or at least a better response than Tharg which after all is all that is required for survival. You don't have to win the human race, just make sure you don't come last. Assuming the correct response is run away, then your brain will start dumping chemicals and signals all over your body to allow you to do the running away as effectively as possible. And it does all this without you once having to think about it. This is all good if the primary imperative is survival. Of course, this unconscious reaction can and is manipulated for political, religious and commercial reasons. How far can that go? Well, Darren Brown managed to program ordinary people into carrying out an armed robbery on a security van in just two weeks by implanting subconscious emotional triggers into their memories. When the memories were triggered on the day, their brains were hijacked and they drew their guns without knowing why they were doing it. How was he able to do that? All of your sensory inputs, apart from your sense of smell, enter the brain through the thalamus. The thalamus has connections to the neocortex and the amygdala. The amygdala processes emotional responses. Louis Cozzoloni, in his 2006 book, The Neuroscience of Human Relationships, Attachment and the Developing Social Brain, states that fear activation can occur in the amygdala within 50 milliseconds whilst conscious processing in the hippocampus takes 500 to 600 milliseconds. A paper by Jonathan Freeman et al. published in the Journal of Neuroscience, August 6, 2014, entitled Amygdala Responsivity to High-Level Social Information from Unseen Faces, demonstrates how people can react to a face presented to them subliminally for just 33 milliseconds. FMRI scans showed that a person would decide whether a given face was trustworthy or not without their ever consciously perceiving that face. And this is why we can react without thinking. The problem for us modern humans comes when our amygdala gets carried away. If we get an emotional overload, often triggered by an emotional input which initiates a negative emotion feedback loop based on past memories, we can go into sensory shutdown. It might be as simple as somebody saying something which cuts us to the quick. Just words, but for some reason they tear us up. It might be a tack on us, or on someone we love, or perhaps on our beliefs. Or perhaps someone is trying to take something from us, a material possession, the person we love, our place in traffic, or a belief which we have learnt to defend. And perhaps we were having a bad day anyway. 
This is when our amygdala takes over and hijacks our brain. We might try to reason our way through things, analyse the situation, rationalise, but our amygdala remains in charge. It is busy dumping chemicals around our brain and body, and it has the shortest route to our memories and the strongest memories, the ones which have been reinforced by being linked with emotional context. The harder we try to reason and use our memories to do so, the more emotions flood over us base emotions. We want to fight by doing damage to something or someone, smash the world, or we want to flight, run away, and perhaps even kill ourselves, which is the most extreme running away there can be. And this hijacking of our brain by the amygdala can last for hours, even days. By understanding what is happening, it might be possible to resist the amygdala hijack. My own method is to embrace the emotions, accept that they are part and parcel of who I am, don't try to fight and reason with them. As soon as we try to use reason and logic, we will lose because the amygdala can put a spin on every memory we have faster than we can recall it. So instead I forcefully occupy myself, distract myself and deliberately avoid situations which are likely to reinforce negative emotions. This last bit sounds odd. It sounds like I am applying free will I deny exists. That's a deeper discussion for another day. What we think we are doing and what we are actually doing may be different things. But for now, thank you as always for watching.